it's, it's a great honor to be here, and uh, I'm, uh, I'd like to acknowledge the organizers and also um, Helena and Milton, who are my hosts next week in Campinas, and helped to arrange my first trip to Brazil. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, problems of the interface between geometry analysis and economics. Um, and I'm going to talk about one of the mainstream models in microeconomic theory, which is uh, sometimes, there are a lot of buzzwords associated with this problem. Um, it's used to model many different economic phenomena, uh, including, um, so typically you have a single entity on one side of the market and a group of entities on the other side. So it might be a government and it wants to figure out the best way to, the best tax policy in order to uh, not discourage people from working and reporting income, but it's still at the same time collect enough taxes to keep the government uh, uh, functional. And it's also, it was also used to model uh, hiring labor market contracts. So a company wants to employ, uh, pick employees from a large pool of possible um, laborers. So that was an application pioneered by Spence. And uh, in his models, the, uh, the assumption is that uh, we're gonna use education as a proxy for how much talent a person has. So in other words, uh, we don't value what they may have learned when they were being educated, but, but rather the fact that they got an advanced degree is some evidence that they're a competent person. And we therefore want to decide how much we're going to pay people that have advanced degrees as opposed to people who have basic degrees or high school degrees. And we want to structure our contracts in such a way that we hire the best people for our company. But the application which I'm going to talk about the most today is sort of a nonlinear pricing problem. And we'll describe that problem in a moment. But, um, but let me mention that um, some, one of the things that's exciting to me about this area is there's kind of a revolution, uh, a sort of a scientific revolution that I think is brewing in economics and sort of all of the, there were dramatic advances in the 20th century in physics where you saw that differential geometry became relevant to the theory of gravity after Einstein and uh, lots of sophisticated probability and analysis have become relevant to the theory of physics after statistical physics, Gibbs and Boltzmann and the, the people that followed them. And somehow all of these developments are still waiting to take place in economics. And so I want to show you an example today of a place where the theory of differential geometry becomes very relevant to not only this, but sort of a wide swath of economic problems. And actually for more or less the same reason that it became relevant to physics. So we can talk about that at the end. Um, so basically in all of these models, these are all, all models of equilibration where you're trying to figure out how supply will balance with demand in a particular situation to determine the value of some commodities or that are gonna be traded, contracts or, um, or taxation or in my case, um, nonlinear pricing. So what's the nonlinear price problem? So I just put some names of, of economists who've worked on this problem on the first slide. Um, so the nonlinear pricing problem started out in work of Musa and Rosen. Uh, but what you should imagine is that you're, say, an automobile manufacturer and you wanna design and market cars to a, a population. And it's a simplifying assumption that you, you don't have any competitors in this. Uh, but what, what's going to prevent you from raising prices arbitrarily high is that people can choose not to buy a car from you. And okay, so what is a car? Well, a car is parameterized by things like its fuel efficiency, its comfort, its safety, its reliability, its performance. So a car is a point in a five dimensional space. If we think of a few more parameters, it becomes a point in a seven dimensional space. And um, <clears throat> similarly, we're gonna kind of parameterize our potential our potential buyers by their preferences, how much they care about fuel efficiency, how much they care about uh, performance. So different, different individuals are gonna have different kind of preferences. And um, we're gonna model a, a potential consumer as a point in a high dimensional space as well. And it's a simplifying assumption that let's make for the beginning of the talk that the dimensions of these two spaces, cars and potential consumers are the same. And so the problem that you're facing is that you know exactly what it costs you to manufacture a car with particular parameters. And you've also done some market research. And so you've determined how much is a car with particular parameters, a car of type Y, to a, how valuable is it to a person, a potential consumer of type X. So you know this function B of XY. You also know this function C, how much does it cost me to make a car of type Y. And you, you also know how many consumers of type X are there in the population as opposed to consumers of type X prime. So you have a probability measure on the space of consumers. And what you're free to decide is which cars you're going to manufacture and how much you're gonna charge for each of them. And you'd like, to, uh, you'd like to choose this price function so as to maximize your profits. 
And what prevents you from raising prices too high is that people can decide to opt out. So there's a particular product, we'll call it Y Null, which costs you nothing to produce, but you're also not allowed to charge for it. So if you raise your prices on all your other products too high, everyone's going to choose the null option. Why not? Why null? Um, <clears throat> and uh, so this is a little bit of a depressing theory, by the way, because it's the same theory that's supposed to explain uh, why airlines have to make economy class sufficiently uncomfortable that people that have the means to buy up to business class will do so, or people who are traveling on somebody else's dime will do so. And uh, so it can be a very depressing theory, but on the other hand, what, uh, mathematics is universal. And so what I'd like to assure you of is that the same mathematics can, if you don't, if you're not happy with monopolists maximizing their profits, you can create a variant of the theory where what you're trying to do is maximize social welfare. So for example, you're a public transit company or a public electricity company, and you want to produce, you want to set up a transit network to, pr to provide as much good as possible to the population under the constraint that you don't go bankrupt. And it turns out, so this is kind of a very utopian idea, it turns out the same mathematics describes that model. You introduce a Lagrange multiplier for the constraint that you go, don't go bankrupt, and then the, the variational problem that you're trying to maximize is, has the same form. And, uh, and the problem that I want to talk about today is when is this problem soluble? When do you have good algorithms to approximate the solution numerically? When do you have good theorems that tell you what a solution will look like? So... Uh, you can also think about this a little bit game theoretically, if you like, where you have this one monopolist competing against a whole population of agents, and everyone's trying to do as well as they can for themselves. And so what the strategy of the monopolist in this setting is the strategy is he chooses the price menu. So he assigns a price V to every type of automobile Y, subject only to the, well, we're going to insist the price be lower semi-continuous, and we're going to insist that he can't charge for this null option, the opt-out. And uh, given a price menu V, what all the agents, the potential buyers in the population are going to do is they're going to look at how valuable is car Y to them minus what they have to pay for it, and they're going to try to maximize that over all potential types of automobile Y. So they're going to compute this maximum of the difference between the value function B and the price function V, and that will give us a function of X, uh, of X, which you might think of as kind of an indirect utility that the agents derive when they're facing price menu V. And they will choose, an agent X will choose a car, Y, V, V of X, which attains this maximum. And um, the objective of the monopolist is to maximize his net profits, or equivalently to minimize his net losses. And his net losses are what it costs him to make those cars that are purchased minus the revenue that he gets for those cars, and integrated against the population of potential buyers. And so this is the function L that he wants to minimize. I prefer thinking about minima rather than maxima. And um, so it's a problem in the calculus of variations, and the, pro the only difficulty is it's a very nonlinear problem. So the dependence on V of the function L is terribly nonlinear. And so there's not much structure in the problem, and so, okay, maybe there's enough continuity and compactness that you can say that there's some V that's going to attain the minimum, but it's hard to say anything beyond that in general. Uh, another little minor issue is that uh, this ma the, the attainment of this maximum may not be unique. So there may be some points X where you're so there's some ambiguity in which car is selected. Um, now it turns out that if the, if the agents, the potential buyers, mu, are continuously spread throughout the domain capital X, then it turns out that the points X where this max is uniquely attained form a set of measure zero and you can forget about it. However, if you want to deal with very singular measures mu, maybe concentrated at finitely many points, then this maximum can be non-unique at a set of positive mu measure, and then it's convenient to make a tie-breaking rule to say what happens. And the tie-breaking convention we're going to adopt for today is that if, the, if a certain buyer is undecided between several options, the principal can convince them to take the one that's most favorable from the point of view of the monopolist's profits. So uh, it's a tie-breaking rule that goes back to Merlis. Uh, but again, it only becomes relevant in the case that mu concentrates po a positive fraction of its mass on a set of measure zero, in fact, a set of dimension n minus one in this open domain x in n dimensions. So I state the principal's problem once more. And uh, let me point out that in addition to finding this optimal price menu v, the principal also wants to know what cars he should ought to manufacture. So there's implicitly, there's a second measure on the space of automobiles which measures which ones are actually going to be produced. 
And um, you can think of this measure depends on what price menu V the principal adopts. But you can think of it as the image of the measure mu under the mapping YBV from X to Y. So for every subset of Y, the measure of the fraction of automobiles that ought to be produced that set in that set W is given by the mu measure of all those consumers who are going to choose a car in that set W. So, so as, uh, as Helena mentioned, mostly I've worked on optimal transportation. And optimal transportation is sort of the problem that you're given two measures and a function on the product space. And you want to correlate those measures as to, so as to maximize the function B in this case. And here only one of the measures is fixed, the measures on the space of potential consumers. And you're trying to find a second measure on the space of cars you're going to manufacture, which, which correlates with this measure so as to maximize B, but also maximizes the principal's profits. So there's a second, very, second layer of, it's a, a two-level variational problem. And of course, economists first thought about these kind of problems where you had a finitely many cars and finitely many types of consumers. You know, maybe cars with air conditioning and without, and rich consumers and poor consumers. And then in the 70s, uh, um, Michael Spence and James Merlees started thinking about variations of this problem in the context I mentioned above, where you have a continuum of consumers and a continuum of automobiles, but a one-dimensional continuum in each case. So cars are parameterized by quality. Consumers are parameterized by wealth. And what they discovered was that if you make this hypothesis on the valuation function B, that its cross-partial derivatives are positive, then the mapping from consumer types to cars they buy will be a non-decreasing map. And once you know it's a non-decreasing map, the, it's easy to see this variational problem attains a, a minimum. And you can study the minimizer. And it turns out to satisfy an ordinary differential equation with some boundary conditions. So you can more or less solve this problem explicitly, which they did. And they worked out economic interpretations of various possible scenarios. And they uh, both they shared the Nobel Prize in 1996 and 2001 for this work. And so as mathematicians, it's very natural for us to expect that if the one dimensional problem is reduced to an ordinary differential equation, then the higher dimensional problem ought to reduce to a partial differential equation. And this expectation proves to be only partially correct. Life is not that simple. Yeah, so they shared the Nobel Prize with other people in different years. Yeah, 1996 in the case of Merlis and 2001 in the case of Spence. But, but more or less for this theory, for developing this theory. Um, so about the multidimensional problem, uh, progress has been slow. Uh, but there's kind of a famous example that was worked out by Roche and Chenet. Uh, 10 years, 10 or 12 years ago. Uh, and it's the case where you take the, the valuation function to be bilinear in the types of the agents and the types of products. And so one particular example that they talked about at some length, they made the further hypothesis that the cost of the monopolist was quadratic and that the, um, they took the distribution of consumers to be uniform on the unit square. And they put the null product at the origin, so that was the opt-out option. And uh, then they observed the following phenomena. Uh, this, when they, after they solved this problem, well, it turns out if B is bilinear, then for HY, this is an affine function of X. And when I take a supremum parameter by Y over affine functions of X, the, the utility function U is going to be convex. And actually, the mapping from, from agents to cars they choose is given by the derivative of that convex function. But uh, the interesting thing they observed was that the space of potential consumers gets divided into three regions. So the people who care most about automobiles, the blue region up here, uh, they each get a car which is customized to their tastes. So the function u is strictly convex in this region. And indeed, it satisfies some partial differential equation in the blue region. Uh, the people in the red region who care the least about automobiles, the function u turns out to be identically 0 in that region, which is what happens when they choose the null product. I should have mentioned that uh, in my variational problem, which was minimize integral with respect to mu of c y x minus uh, v y x, the um, The, uh, the null product contributes nothing to the principal's profits because both C and V are constrained to be zero for those agents who choose the null product. Um, so there's a positive fraction of them that occupy this red region down at the bottom of the square. 
And under this mapping from agents to products, that gives you a Dirac measure sitting at the origin in the space of products that are consumed. And in between the blue region and the red region is green region. And every agent on one of these green lines here chooses the same product, the car over here. And their interpretation, this is called bunching, and their interpretation of this was that you know, if, if you're rich enough to afford a car but not rich enough to afford a, a custom car, then you're forced to compromise on what kind of vehicle you take. So everybody on this, on this green line has to make some compromise between, say, fuel efficiency and performance. And, uh, okay, so this was very interesting, uh, but it's also very special and it's hard to tell, is this an accident of the choices we made? Or is this going to be true for very general distributions mu and valuation functions b? And uh, for more general valuation functions B, very little was known, as I mentioned, except, uh, except that there was enough continuity and compactness in the problem to say that the minimum over there is attained. So the questions that I want to focus on today are, um, is the minimum unique? Uh, how robust are the, conclude, the bunching conclusions of Roche and Chonet? And is it possible to characterize and compute the minimum in this problem? And uh, our, our perspective on these questions is that life is much, much, much simpler if this can be made into a convex variational problem. Uh, so under what conditions does this problem become a convex program? And I mentioned Carlier's reformulation because uh, 10 years ago, Guillaume Carlier observed that you could reformulate this problem in terms of u instead of v. And then, uh, and so then there was, he, he had this continuity compactness argument, but it's not at all clear whether it's a convex problem in u or not. And so I should describe his reformulation for you. So here is his, here is his framework and his result. Um, so he observes that not every, just as not every function, coming back to the, uh, the example of Roche and Chonet where B was bilinear, we said the resulting u was convex in that case because it was a supremum of affine functions of x. So not every function of u can arise in the Roche and Chenet problem. And the same is true for more general classes b. Not every function u can arise as a supremum of this form. And, uh, but we're only interested in the ones that do. And so let me call that supremum the b transform of v. And of course, I could do a symmetrical operation where I maximize with respect to x instead of maximizing with respect to y, and I call that the B tilde transform. And now it's a cute fact that uh, if you know a little bit of the theory of Legendre transforms and convex duality, you take any function, you put it through the Legendre transform, you get a convex function. If you put that function through the Legendre transform, what you get back is the convex hull, the lower semi-continuous convex hull of the original function. If you put that through the Legendre transform, you get the same thing that you got before over here. So if you do the Legendre transform three times, it's the same as doing it once. And that same fact is true for this B transform here. I take any function, lower semi-continuous function B, transforming it once is the same as transforming it three times. And those functions U, which can arise from some V using a supremum of this form, are precisely those uh, which are fixed under two iterations of this mapping. So I'm going to call U B convex in that case. And Carlet's reformulation is predicated on trying to write this minimum here as a minimum over of some function L of U over B convex functions U. Right. So. so this is how I write B convexity. It's its own second transform. The other thing I know about U is that it should be larger than B of the null product minus C of the null product, which was zero. So let me call this function u null. I want u's which are their own second transform and which are bigger than u null. And my question is, when would this problem here be a convex minimization on a convex domain? And the answer is a little bit remarkable, I think. Uh, but let me remind you of what the advantages of convexity are in this kind of setting. So. Uh, if you have a non-convex function and you try to minimize it numerically, for example, you can slide down the gradient, but you can get stuck in a local minimum. Or you can have non-minimizing critical points. Uh, if you have a convex function, you try to minimize it numerically, you slide down the gradient. When you get to the bottom, you're done. And similarly, if you have a point where the derivative vanishes and you know your functional is convex, then you know you're at a minimum. Or if you have a point where the gradient points out of the domain you're trying to minimize over, you know you're at the global minimum. 
if you're a non-convex problem, that just isn't true. And so this is a big help if you want to give necessary and sufficient conditions for being a minimum, if you want to uh, say, is the minimum unique? Is it stable? And can I design numerics to find it? Okay. So I should say a bit more about, um, about Carlier's reformulation. And uh, of course, with this definition of the B transform, Uh, it's clear that the B transform of any function V minus V plus V is bigger than zero. And what we're interested in are those points where equality is attained because those are the points Y that attain the max here which tell you which product agent X buys. And um, just as in the theory of ordinary convex functions, if I take some non-convex function, I Legendre transform it twice, I get its convex hull. The convex hull will have flat spots where the original function had non-convexities. Flat spots on one side of this story correspond to non-differentiabilities on the other. And so a function is more or less strictly convex if and only if its Legendre transform is differentiable. Um, so motivated by that story, I'm going to say that uh, I'm going to observe that this mapping from agents to the cars they buy is not going to be continuous unless the function B itself is its own second transform under this operation and its dual. And um, even if it is its own second transform, this function may or may not be continuous. In the case where it's continuous, I call V strictly V tilde convex. And that's strict, some kind of notion of strict convexity is going to be relevant to the question of when is this minimum unique. Um, the other thing is that I would like good conditions. I would like to understand which functions Y can attain equality here. And life is simplified somewhat if I make a kind of generalization of the Spence Merlis hypothesis as Kylie did and Gangbo and Levin before him. And I, uh, what I would like to assume, you know, when, oh, sorry, when this function here gets minimized, if everything is differentiable, the derivative of u is going to equal the derivative with respect to x of b. That's the first order condition for minimum. There's a second order condition as well, but I'm not going to talk about it much. And one question is, when can I invert this function to find y as a function of x naught and gradient u? And I, so I'm, let me assume that I can invert this. That would be true for the bilinear function, for example. It would be true if I looked at difference of x, y to some power p strictly larger than 1. So let's assume this mapping here is 1 to 1. And let's call the solution y as a function of x and gradient u. Let's call it yb. So yb is defined by satisfying this equation here. Uh, notice that the, uh, the Spence Merlis condition now is a global condition, whereas in one dimension it was a local condition saying that the y derivative of this function was non-zero, kind of the, the linearization, the implicit function theorem for this, this mapping to a, be a smooth function of x and p. Um, so here is Carlier's reformulation of the problem. Uh, what I really care about is how does, how does this functional look when I try to write it as a functional of u instead of v, and the answer is that it's going to look like the integral over x of c of y of x and gradient u at x. And now I have minus v, but I'm really only interested in evaluating that minus v at those points y which attain the supremum where u is equal to d minus v, so minus v is equal to, I guess, negative v plus u. And so negative v of x y b of x du of x again plus u of x. Here is the functional that I'm interested in minimizing. This is my L of u. And I would like I would like L of u to be a convex function. I would like the set of u's that I'm varying over to be a convex set. And I'm wondering when I can hope for that to be the case. Um, so let me let me now switch gears and tell you about a result from the theory of optimal transport that concerns the question of, suppose the two measures are given, I correlate them so as to maximize B. Cor under the, this one-to-oneness condition on the previous slide, that, that correlation will tell you that every point over here is going to be a function of a point over here, and I want to know, does, it does the point over here depend continuously on the point over here? This is sort of a generalization of the fact that if I have two measures on the line, and I want to correlate them so as to maximize correlations, the best thing to do is to take the leftmost point on the horizontal and 
match it with the bottom point on the vertical. And the next left point on the horizontal match it with the next point up on the vertical and so on. So what I get is a non-decreasing function in the plane. So I'm asking in higher dimensions what the analog of a non-decreasing function. It turns out if you want that analog to be to have some continuity pro properties, you need to make assumptions not a little bit that have the following flavor, actually a little bit weaker than what I've stated here, but uh, let's take the evaluation function to be four times continuously differentiable, and for every fixed point in the product, in the closure of the product, not only do I want to assume that the, this map and its symmetrical map under interchange of x with y should be invertible, let the inverses be smooth, and let the images of these maps be convex. So all that's sort of not too surprising. Um, here's the additional remarkable assumption that I want to make. Let me assume that whenever I have a curve in the product space of x with y, and I look at its image under these two maps here, if that image is a line segment, then I want the mixed fourth derivatives of b to be non-negative. So it's a very strange condition. So you look at the fourth mixed partials. It's not quite the condition that Ma, Schrodinger, and Wang needed for smoothness of optimal maps. It's a little bit stronger because they only needed non-negativity of this when the second mixed partials vanish. But I really need non-negativity of this quantity here when all of them, whether or not the second mixed partials with respect to S and T vanish. So this is a kind of convexity, as we'll see, uh, or a kind of curvature condition, more suggestively, since I'm trying to foreshadow the link to differential geometry. Um, sometimes we want, I want this kind of curvature condition to be strict, and so what's the natural strict? So assume that this is strict whenever it can be. When can it be? Well, when the tangent vectors in question are non-zero. So that will be uniform cross-curvature, uniformly positive cross-curvature. Um, so here's the first theorem that hopefully provides some justification for the uh, for the um, interest of condition B3. So um, before I can talk about convexity of the functional L, I want to know is the set of U I'm minimizing over a convex. And under the first two hypotheses, the set of U that I'm minimizing over is convex if and only if B3 holds. So that's a promising thing. And um, I have to say one direction of this, the sufficiency. So, um, so Jung Han Kim and I had showed that if you take negative distance squared on the round sphere, the Euclidean distance on the round sphere, then that actually satisfies condition B3. And Tomonari Say, a statistician who was look, looking at cosmological data, so he had mass distributions on the sphere because you're looking out into space and you're seeing where the stars are, and he was interested in, in uh, approximate parameterizing families of probability densities that would approximate them, and so again, he wanted a convex set of parameters to vary over, and he exploited our convexity, and so he noticed that, indeed, the uh, condition B3 for this cost here implies convexity of the set at the same time we did our work. Okay, so that tells you when is the domain I'm varying over convex. I also want to know when is the functional convex. And, um, of course, the functional depends on what's the cost to the manufacturer of manufacturing a car of type Y, and so I'm going to need some hypotheses on C. And it turns out that the hypothesis on C that works is, um, is that exactly I need C to be its own second transform under this supremum, under this v tra uh, B transform operation. So if C is its own second transform under B transforming things, then the net losses are convex functional on the set of things that I'm trying to vary over. So all of this sounds like good news. Um, and again, sometimes it's useful to have strict convexity. And so it turns out that what I really care about is the convexity of this difference as a function of P, because that difference is exactly what appears in here as a function of gradient U. And if the, the proposition, the conditions of the proposition guarantee that this difference will be a convex function of P, when will it be strictly convex? Well, either I need the, the uniform version of B3 to hold, or I need the function C to be strictly V tilde convex, or I can get away with something slightly weaker. Like, you know, I can assume that this thing is con strictly convex for every point where it can be, every x not different from x. And uh, so what's a kind of theorem, an example of a theorem that one can prove under hypotheses like these? Uh, 
So assume one of the, the, the same hypotheses as before plus one of the strict versions, one, two, or three. And also make the tie-breaking rule if mu is concentrated on small sets. Then the principle has a unique optimal strategy. And what does that mean? It means that u is uniquely determined mu almost everywhere. Or if I think about things on the space of products, it means that for every car that the principle is actually going to manufacture, there's a unique equilibrium price, V, which is the B transform of U. And uh, for the cars which he's not going to manufacture, there's a lower bound on prices he can charge for those because he doesn't want them to become tempting to any of the agents in the market. And this, this uniqueness theorem works equally well. If you make the tie-breaking rule, it works equally well for uh, continuous and discrete probabilities. Um, once you have uniqueness, you also have stability. So if you're in a situation where uniqueness holds and you approximate all the data, uh, that is BC and mu, then you can check as the approximation becomes finer and finer, um, then the, uh, the solution to the approximate problem will converge to the solution of the limiting problem in a strong sense. Uh, again, assuming that you're in a situation where uniqueness holds for the limiting problem. So the, the UI of the approximate problem converges uniformly to the U infinity. And what's the topology in which you want to approximate the data? You want B to convert to be C too close to be infinity and C to be L infinity close to the, the limiting cost and you put a weak topology on the measures. So I should tell you some examples of cost of valuation functions B for this, which this works. And then I'll also try to tell you some examples in which we can say something about the robustness. So what I'm going to be able to say about the robustness is a little bit weaker than we would like, but you know, we do what we can. So what we observed in the Roche and Chonet example was that actually a positive fraction of agents were priced out of the market. There was a red region down in the lower right hand, lower left hand corner of the square of people who didn't buy cars. So this phenomenon was actually observed a few years before Roche and Chonet by Armstrong. And uh, he noted that this doesn't always happen in one dimension, but it always happens in more than one dimension under some hypotheses. And uh, so he sort of said this is, this is a manifestation of a multidimensional problem that you know if you haven't priced a positive fraction of your potential buyers out of the market, then you're not maximizing your profits. And that, that's the statement that, uh, that we can show extends to all costs which satisfy, well, all costs which satisfy B3 under a few extra conditions. What kind of costs satisfy our hypothesis B3? Uh, well, there's the bilinear cost. And actually something interesting happens with the bilinear cost. So my condition was that uh, I wanted to take four partial derivatives along some special curves and I wanted that to be non-negative, um, where these curves satisfied conditions like dx of b at x s uh, y0 has no second derivative with respect to s and the symmetrical condition for with y and x interchanged. Um, if, you try to, if you try to check this for the bilinear cost of Roche and Chenet, what you get here is identically zero. And so it satisfies this hypothesis B3, but it barely satisfies it. So certain perturbations of the Roche and Chonet cost will continue to satisfy B3, but others will violate it. And uh, for example, if I add a product A times B to the Roche and Chonet cost, then if A and B are convex, I'm in good shape. B3 will hold. And if they're uniformly convex in the sense that the Hessian of A is bounded below by something larger than zero, and similarly Hessian B is bounded below by something larger than zero, the strong version, positive cross curvature holds. But if I can find a point where this guy is non-negative and this guy isn't, then I'm out of luck. B3 will be violated if, if A is convex at some point and B fails to be convex at all points. The has to be as negative at some point. That's bad news for me. And okay, so this is a very special example. Let me tell you a geometrically more interesting example. And so let me start out with the roche a problem and modify it a bit. So imagine that you're, um, so the mathematics is going to be the same. The economic interpretation is going to be a little different. And so the interpretation is you live in a square town with the population uniformly distributed over the square. And there's a well in the center of town where everyone wants to get their water. 
and a company comes into town, and they, uh, a transportation company, and they decide that they will try to profit by transporting water to someone that is more convenient for the residents. And so residents who live close, close to the well will probably continue to get their water from the well, but residents who live further away may be willing to pay something to have water transported to them if it's inconvenient for them to travel to the well. And so let's assume that the inconvenience to a resident to have to travel from their home to the well to get the water, their water is something proportional to the distance squared that they have to go. And uh, let's also assume that the cost to the company that's going to do the water supplying is nothing. That it's negligible cost. And it turns out, and it turns out this is mathematically exactly similar to re the reflection of the Roche and Chenet example in the horizontal and vertical axes. And so what you will see when you solve this problem is that there'll be a diamond of residents around the well who go directly to the well to get their water. In the corners of the two by two square, those residents will pay a high fee to have the transportation company deliver the water to a location, a unique location close to their home. And residents who live in this intermediate region here, all the residents on this line here will go to the diagonal to pick up their water at some location that they pay a lower fee to receive it at. And okay, so it's mathematically the same as the Roche and Chenet example, but it's it's nicer from the point of view of perturbing because you, I can easily say now let the, since I'm now dealing with the distance squared instead of the inner product, I can now say let's take a round town instead of a square town with a well in the center. And then what you see is a round region of people who will go to the center to collect their water and concentric rings of people who are willing to pay uh, to have the water delivered to some point on the ring close to them. And the further out the li they live, the more they'll be willing to pay. And you already noticed that some of the bunching that you observed up here is a feature of the non-strict convexity of the domain. It's a little bit different when the domain is strictly convex. And if I, if I imagine that my town is no, lo longer, no longer located on the flat plane, but if I put it on the round sphere instead, or maybe so if it's on top of a mountain, or if it's at a saddle point in the mountains, and I choose my valuation function, the distance squared here, to reflect that geometry. So let me take it to be the Riemannian distance on the round sphere, say, or the Riemannian distance. I mean, I, I like to model a saddle using the hyperbolic plane. It's mathematically convenient. And it turns out the question of whether it's the round sphere or the hyperbolic plane makes a difference. So if you take your town to be, if you take your population to be uniformly distributed on the Arctic Circle, and their well is at the North Pole, then hypothesis B3 is satisfied by this condition and so there will be a unique solution and it will respect the circular symmetry of the problem. But if I take my town to be a round disk, a round region in the hyperbolic disk, it turns out that this hypothesis will be violated if I choose the cost of the consumer to go from X to Y to get their water to be the hyperbolic distance. And so it's, you know, it's not at all clear that the solution will still respect the symmetry of the disk. It could be that there are two lines along which the well is distributed and People have to go to those lines to get the water, and every rotation of that solution would again be a solution. So the set of solutions will be spherically symmetric, but it may not. Uh, but each individual solution may not, may not be. Uh, and. Um, So here's one more result. I think this is probably the last economic result. Oops, sorry, thanks. I should stand on the other side and I wouldn't have this problem. Um, so our expectation is that we expect robustness of the roche chenet conclusions only with respect to those valuation functions which respect our hypothesis B3. What we're actually able to prove is that if you assume B0 to B3 and that C is its own transform, second transform under the B and B tilde transform operations. And if the density of consumers is, say, C1 or belongs to some sublev space, and if you have some strict convexity in the problem, then any minimizer will have the property that a positive fraction of agents are priced out of the market. Now, what is the strict convexity assumption here? It's the assumption, remember, as part of V2, we assume that this, this guy here was a convex set. The set of all consumers is viewed from the null product. So assume this convex set in Rn has no n minus 1 dimensional facets. So no flat spots of top dimension on its boundary. So under this hypothesis, you're able to prove that a positive fraction of agents are always priced out of the market if you're maximizing your profits. 
remember Armstrong made a big deal out of this fact that this doesn't always happen in one dimension. And here you see why. So these were bounded domains. So if n is 1, this is an interval, and it has two zero-dimensional facets, namely its endpoints. And so the theorem doesn't apply, and indeed there are counterexamples to this theorem in one dimension. Because the, the strict convexity hypothesis here can't be satisfied. So, so far I've told you a long list of results. This is a key ingredient in, in the proof, and it's really, um, I said that you could, in some sense, think of this hypothesis B3 as being related to convexity of something. What is the something? Well, it's a difference of two costs, two valuations. So fix any two different types of potential consumer, X and X1, and look at the relative value of product Y to X1 and to X. Evaluated X and Q is a proxy for a gradient of U, and I want this to be a convex function of U. And it turns out that this is an if and only if statement. So I can understand it. If I don't want to take four derivatives of V, if it's not smooth enough, I can understand B3 as being an assertion of the convexity of this difference here, as long as I can define YB. So maybe I should recall that uh, YB was defined by um, the derivative of X of BX, YB of XP equaling P. That was the definition of YB, and we assumed in the first hypothesis told us it was well defined. So this was uh, V1, and this was B3. Uh, so at the beginning, so maybe I, I could say, if, well, maybe one thing I'll say is what is the relevance of, I said if I wanted LU to be convex, I needed this function C to be its own second transform. What's the relevance of that? Well, that tells me that C of Y is equal to the supremum over all X of BXY minus C transform of X. And um, so now when I'm looking at a difference like this, it tells me that C of Y BXP minus B of X y b x p. So I better call this x tilde. Is equal to supremum over x tilde of b x tilde y b x p minus uh, b of x y b x p minus c b tilde of x tilde. And this function here, if these guys are all convex functions of P and then I take a supremum of them, I will again get a convex function of P. And so that, that's clear that if, if the conclusion of this lemma is true, then the argument here is going to be convex in gradient U because I'm t a supremum of convex functions of P is again a convex function of P. Uh, so I won't tell you how you prove this argument here. It's, not such, it's, a, it's a nice exercise. It's not such an easy exercise. But let me instead try to tell you what the geometric content of these hypotheses is. So I started out by saying that there should be some connection between the story and general relativity. And more or less, there's a philosophical reason why there should be a connection between these theories. And that is that uh, general rel Einstein's theory of general relativity started from the principle that physics should be the same to all observers. And similarly, there's a principle going on here. So in other words, if I make diffeomorphisms of coordinates, the physics should be described by diffeomorphism independent objects. And what's going on here is that I have a lot of freedom about how I parameterize cars. And I also have a lot of freedom about how I parameterize customers. And the idea is that if, if, if Milton and I choose different ways of parameterizing cars, but the, the parameterizations are equivalent up to diffeomorphism, and if he and I choose different ways of parameterizing customers, but the parameterizations are equivalent up to diffeomorphism, then any predictions that he, if he builds a theory and I build a theory, they ought to make the same predictions. And so that they ought to be described in terms of coordinate independent quantities. And so indeed, what kind of coordinate independent quantities ought to be floating around? Well, this somehow ought to be a coordinate independent quantity. And indeed, I'm going to argue that it's, it's kind of a Riemannian curvature, sectional curvature of a certain kind. So here is a geometric point of view uh, on this story. 
let me look at um, let me look at the product of the spaces of X of car types and Y of consumer types, and uh, let me assume that my B is such that its mixed partials, the, its n by n matrix of mixed partial derivatives have non-zero determinant. So that's actually implied by the diffeomorphism condition in B1. And it, again, it's a generalization of the spencer release condition from one dimension. So as long as this determinant is non-zero, I can build the following geometrical object. I can, it, in coordinates, it would be a matrix that has n by n blocks, four n by n blocks. I put zero on the diagonal n by n blocks, and I put the mixed partial and its transpose on the off diagonal. Right, that's a symmetric, a, a symmetric bilinear form on the cotangent space to the product of these manifolds. And actually, it turns out that because of this special form, the zeros and the off-diagonal blocks, whenever in, in a coordinate system, if PQ is an eigenvector of that form, then P minus Q will be an eigenvector with the opposite eigenvalue. So it's not a positive definite form. It is a non-degenerate form because of this hypothesis. But it's what I'm going to describe as a geometry which, like Lorentzian geometry is not positive definite, but which in, in which you have space-like and time-like directions. And because of this observation, the number of space-like directions is going to equal the number of time-like directions. So it's going to be n positive eigenvalues and n corresponding negative eigenvalues. It's a pseudometric. Notice I could also put a, a minus sign here. So I could make this anti-symmetric instead of symmetric. And then, I, then it turns out I would have a, because of the non-degeneracy hypothesis, I would have a symplectic form on the product space. So I had these hypotheses B1, B2, and B3. B2 was some kind of convexity of the image of some domain under this nonlinear map here. And I claim that that convexity is actually closely related to this pseudometric tensor. So you can use the same kind of formulas that you use in differential geometry to define geodesics and curvatures, even if the metric is not positive definite, as long as, as, long as the metric has no zeros in it. And it turns out that what I'm really asking for is that for every x naught and y naught, I want the vertical fibers and the horizontal fibers of my space to be geodesic, in the sense that it, I pick a point here, I pick a point there, I should be able to connect them with a geodesic with respect to that metric h from the preceding page, which stays within the horizontal fiber. And um, actually, because of the special form of the metric tensor that I introduced, Uh, it turns out that any any vector which is horizontal, which is parallel to this sheet here, is going to have zero inner product with itself. So the, this, the, the red lines here actually form the light cone in the signature NN geometry. And uh, things in here will be space-like. They'll be positive definite. Things in here will be time-like. They'll, be, they'll have negative definite tangent vectors, crudely speaking. Um, what is hypothesis B3? It says that if you compute the Ramanian curvatures associated to this metric here, you're asking for certain sectional curvatures to be non-negative, and they're exactly the sectional curvatures of two planes spanned by one horizontal vector and one vertical vector. So that's my hypothesis B3. Um, it's maybe a little hard to motivate the connections to curvature, except through this story about diffeomorphism and variance. But let me, let me come back to the examples of the town in the saddle and the town on the spherical cap. So if I took B to be negative the distance squared on some Ramanian manifold, so imagine I have two geodesics parameterized on a Ramanian manifold by their arc length. And if they're passing through the same point here, which is a very special situation. I mean, in general, I would take one geodesic over here and one geodesic over there. But in the case when they happen to pass through the same point, I can compute this fourth derivative explicitly because I know how to expand the distance squared on a small triangle. I use the parallelogram law from Euclidean space, and the first non-trivial correction is the sectional curvature. And so that's already you're seeing sectional curvature manifested in this kind of derivative, at least in a Ramanian setting. Never mind pseudo-Ramanian. Um, and similarly, um, well, maybe I skipped this one. So there's a spe in this situation where I've taken the valuation function to be given x and y are equal to each other. They're both equal to some Ramanian manifold. And I've taken the distance squared on the Ramanian manifold to, give, to define my valuation function. Then a result of Loperis says actually the manifold sits on the diagonal in the product of m with m. 
x and y are both equal to L. And it embed, embeds isometrically on the diagonal. And the curvatures on the diagonal in the product space with respect to this pseudometric H are given by the sectional curvatures in the basic manifold of the two plane span by P and Q. But what this theorem, so this theorem tells me very clearly what's going on in the diagonal in this distance squared case. What it doesn't tell me is what's happening off the diagonal. And that's kind of an interesting question. What does, what does, if, if, if I have a manifold such that this function satisfies B3, not only on the diagonal, but off the diagonal in the product space, what do I learn about that manifold? One of the theorems of Cedric Villani and Gregoire Lopez is that under some further restrictions, what you learn about that manifold is that it's cut locus. If, if you view the cut locus in the tangent space, the cut domains are convex. So the cut locus is sort of an old object in differential geometry about which not so much is known. And uh, so this is sort of a surprising result that you can learn things from this geometric condition that came out of the optimal theory of optimal transportation about classical Riemannian geometry questions. So what I want to close with today is what is the connection of the problem I, define, I described to the symplectic form omega and the pseudometric tensor H, which I defined here. And so let me remark that the correspondence between agents and products they choose is sort of, you can imagine as being an n-dimensional object in the product space. And um, if I have an object in the product space, it's called Lagrangian if every pair of tangent vectors to it have zero inner product with respect to the form, the symplectic form omega. It's called space-like if every tangent vector P has non-negative inner product with itself with respect to the form H. And here's a theorem that comes out of joint work with various authors. I should have said most of what I've described today is joint work with Alessio Figali and Jung Han Kim. But this theorem is joint work with Jung Han Kim, Brennan Pass, who's a PhD student who just finished in Toronto, and Michael Warren, who's a postdoc in Princeton. And more or less, it can be interpreted to say that the graph of the product selected in the product space x dot y is always contained in an n-dimensional Lipschitz submanifold, which is Lagrangian with respect to the symplectic form and space-like with respect to the metric H. And in fact, there's a metric conformally equivalent to H. If you put the right conformal factor in front of H, this n-dimensional subset of the two n-dimensional product space is actually going to have zero mean curvature. So somehow there's this surprising connection between this economic problem with the classical problem in geometric measure theory, which is, you know, find a zero mean curvature surface. Usually it's co-dimension one in geometric measure theory. Here it's co-dimension n in a two-n dimensional space. And maybe that's a good place to stop.